Coming in at number 9 we have Bringing Back the Dead. Now this next experiment wasn't performed on humans but at the end they said it would work on humans which is absolutely insane. There was a study done in California that wanted to see if you could take a dead organ and implant it into a person and have that person live. This should be impossible because once an organ is dead the cells will no longer function. Well turns out that's not true. They were able to successfully transfer a dead heart into a baboon and the baboon could use it to survive. However, it did later die, but this was the early stages of the testing, and as I said before, they were confident that they could eventually use this on humans. I guess you could get a big discount on a heart if it's been dead for a little while. Coming in at number six, we have MK Ultra. This is one of the most famous experiments for several reasons. One, the CIA was involved. They funded, documented, and participated in almost everything associated with the test. There were some people who think that Charles Manson was one of the test subjects, and on top on top of all of this, conspiracy theory people love this one. For those of you who don't know, MKUltra was when the American government went deep into trying to find a way to perform mind control on people. They did this through many means. Sometimes they would put people in isolation for extended periods of time. They would also see how hypnosis affects the brain. And the most popular part about this is they would use LSD to see how much it would affect people and if their minds could be controlled with the drug. One thing they would do is have prostitutes that were actually CIA agents, dose Johns, and then watch what would happen to them. That's a night you won't soon forget. And bringing it back to the Charles Manson conspiracy, some people think that they used LSD on him while he was in prison because they would also take prisoners for these experiments and not tell them what was happening. And through this, some people think Charles Manson learned how to influence people through LSD and later used this to build his cult. Coming in at number five, we have Project Artichoke. Turns out the CIA tried to master mind control more than once. While MKUltra was more of a test to control the mind surrounding LSD and seeing if they could control a person to divulge secret information, Project Artichoke was seeing if they could control a person's mind and make them do their bidding. Basically, if you can make them a robot and send them out into the world to do whatever you wanted. None of these test subjects knew they were being experimented on and some of the attempts at controlling a person came through getting them addicted to morphine and seeing how far they would go to get a fix. Coming in at number four, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. This study was done to see if human beings naturally gravitate towards being evil if given the opportunity. It was run by Philip Zimbardo and it took place in a fake prison where students volunteered to be both prisoners and prison guards. This would mimic a real prison scenario. At first glance, it would seem that humans have a tendency to treat each other horribly and will abuse power as the prison guards started treating the prisoners horribly even though they knew they were fellow students. They would go out of their way to humiliate them and many prisoners started to show signs of mental breakdown. The experiment was cut short because the violence increased to such a level that the safety of the students was at risk. So are people naturally monsters? Well, it wouldn't seem so. It was later revealed that Zimbardo told the students playing the guards that they should treat the prisoners poorly and encourage their malicious behavior. So the study wasn't conducted on fair grounds and is now viewed as something extremely unethical. Coming in at number three, we have the Stateville Penitentiary Malaria Test. Here's something I'm learning from this list. If you're in prison and they ever offer you to do some testing, say no, because who knows what's going to happen to you and it seems that the people testing you see you as expendable. I think I'll just serve out my sentence without being exposed to some sort of horrible disease or experimental well, the Stateville malaria test was put in place to help out the war effort in World War II. There was a huge problem with malaria, so the Americans wanted to come up with a vaccine. They did this by offering prisoners the opportunity to be part of some testing. Mind you, the people involved were willful applicants, but I don't think they knew the severity of what they were getting themselves into. Coming in at number two, we have the Tuskegee study. When you hear about stuff like this, it makes perfect sense why people don't trust the government or government officials. In the year 1932, the Tus Tuskegee study was started and saw almost 400 black men in Alabama infected with syphilis without them knowing. The purpose of the study was to see the long-term effects of syphilis which range from syphilis infecting your eyes and causing you to go blind. It can go into your spine and cause your spinal column to decay. And it can also go into your brain and cause you to go insane, as well as a ton of other horrible effects. This was a government funded experiment and all of the subjects were black men. They were told that they were being treated for bad blood. One of the most
most horrible aspects of this study was that it went on for 40 years, well after the cure for syphilis was discovered. Kicking off the list at number 10, the aviator suit. When it comes to new ideas and new inventions, it almost seems messy at first, all the time. It's always a horrible start. And today's list is quite messy. A lot of horrible experiments done with groups of unaware subjects. To kick this grim one off, we'll look back to the early 1900s. We'll start with Franz Reichelt, a known inventor of the time. He invented his own version of a wearable aviator suit. It was a parachute. It was made of 320 square feet of fabric. It wasn't light at all. And in 1912, Franz wanted to test this new invention out in public, but instead of using a dummy and throwing that off the Eiffel Tower, Franz wanted to be brave and he strapped himself in. And the rest is history. Dark, horrible fast history. Number nine. The Hoffling Hospital Experiment. This experiment happened all the way back in 1966, so a bit more recent, in a time where the rules of psychological experiments, well, didn't really exist, really. I was gonna say they were kinda loose, but no, they were not really a thing at all. Because of this, the nurses that were all part of this experiment had no idea that they were participants, which nowadays is totally illegal, very illegal. The night nurse would receive a phone call during the shift, and on the other end would be Dr. Smith, who's actually the researcher in this scenario. He would ask the nurses to check the medical cabinet to see if they had a called astrotin, which was actually a that was made up for this experiment, and it was actually just a placebo, so don't worry too much. The astrogen would clearly state the maximum dosage of 10 milligrams, but Dr. Smith would ask the nurses to administer 20 milligrams. They were told that the doctor was in a hurry and he would sign the papers later and all that jazz. This just had to get done that night. This had to be delivered to the patient ASAP. If the nurse decided to give the patient the drug, they would be breaking three rules. They're not allowed to accept instructions over the phone. The dose was double the maximum limit stated on the box and the medicine itself was unauthorized. Big two. And it was not in the word stock list so it shouldn't be used in the hospital in the first place. Big three red flags right there. Out of the 22 unknowing nurse participants, 21 of them went to administer this Yeah, big oof on that one, yikes. To be fair, that's the entire point of this test. This is nothing towards the nurses, I'm not ripping on them at all. I mean, this was 1966, we didn't know quite a bit back in the day, you know what I mean? This really showed the pressure nurses are put under randomly in the middle of the night, if anything. Number eight, UCLA schizophrenia experiment. Starting in 1983, UCLA researchers Michael Gitlin and Keith Neutraline went to great and pretty unethical lengths just to see how people who are suffering from schizophrenia relapse, yeah. Basically, they're trying to figure out if there is a way to predict the relapse or, you know, a psychosis episode of some sorts. Now, sounds like a good idea on paper, I guess, but the way you go about things, historically, come on, we could have done a lot better. Unfortunately, this experiment involved recruiting hundreds of participants who were all being treated for schizophrenia at the time and then just taking them off their meds completely. Yeah, as I said that, you at home probably went, ooh. Yeah, that's exactly right. What a horrible idea. Like, we're going the opposite way here. We're not supposed to do this, right? There's no suitable plan and order for when they could return to their medication. And they also didn't do a good job making sure these patients were actually safe during these experiments. They're like, yeah, let's just take people off their meds. See what happens. It's horrible. It's one of the worst. Unfortunately, the results were as bad as you thought and proved to be fatal, but one of the participants, Antonio Le Madrid, ended up taking his own life. Again, not sure what we expected here in this sense. An article from 1994 also said the doctors failed to get proper consent from the patients as well. Just a cherry on top of this horrible experiment. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse. There you go. Number seven, psychic driving. British psychiatrist Donald Ewan Cameron is to blame for this one. Remember that name. Don't listen to anything he says. He created the psychic driving concept that the CIA found interesting to say the least. Basically, psychic driving was a procedure that subjects patients to a continuous, repeated audio loop of something that's intended to change their behavior. Just the same line or the same whatever over and over thousands of times. And through the course of their treatment, they would also be paralyzed while being exposed to the loop message. Yeah, the worst thing ever, right? So the CIA heard about this and started sending money to fund Cameron's experiments, but he actually didn't know it was coming from the CIA because they used a fake name, classic CIA. Cameron would subject patients to paralytics and electroconvulsive therapy, stronger than usual as well, just to make things worse, just at a horrible limit. The experiments were mostly conducted on patients who entered the institute for more common problems like anxiety disorders or postpartum depression, and they ended up leaving with permanent effects from his actions. These included things like amnesia, being unable to speak, some people forgot their parents' names and thought that the interrogators were actually their real parents, just horrible things, their minds were just so confused. Brutal, brutal stuff. Number six, go pills. Here in Toronto, we have go trains, go buses, but not go pills, not yet. 
Hopefully not ever, actually. Yeah, move over five hour energy. We got some competition on the horizon. Staying awake is challenging. Even when you're doing something you absolutely enjoy, like watching a movie, you'll still fall asleep. It just happens, we're human. My dad fell asleep in a theater once in the moving chairs. I couldn't believe it. Guy's 3D glasses were falling off of his face. I was in shock. But he works a lot. He works crazy hours, he's older. That's where go pills were supposed to come in handy. Workers who have these long shifts and work late hours to pay the bills. This pill was supposed to keep you up for 40 hours straight, so a bit much, I'd say. The US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, which is much less air coming out of my mouth, is currently funding this pill. But what if it's mistreated? I can't even begin to imagine the negative effects something like this could have on people. We could barely handle Tide Pods as a community. You know what I mean? It's kind of a bad idea, I vote. Number five, the Milgram Experiment. When learning about our past in further detail, like the Trinity Test, for example, and how that led to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's important to understand why these things happened and why these people did this, or more so how people are influenced into doing these horrible things historically, especially in large numbers. So the Milgram Experiment was put in place to get an idea. How far will people go when it comes to obeying instructions, specifically if it involves a third party being hurt? Well, Stanley Milgram, Yale psychologist, created this test. There's three important roles for this one. You need the teacher, the experimenter, and the learner. The learner is disguised as the main test subject, but really, they're actually in on the whole thing. The real subject is over here. The teacher, the one administering pain to the test subjects. So they're told by this higher figure, whoever, to keep upping the pain every time they get a question wrong. They're like the rule maker. So the real test here is to see how far humans will go when hurting others under direct authority. It's important to note that the subject also isn't actually getting shocked at all. Again, they're in on it. They play it up. They play it up more and more just to see what's going on. These tests were underway in 1961 in a basement at Yale University. In college, I did improv. That's wild. That's a wild after school curricular activity. Number four, Unit 731. The Imperial Japanese Army's Unit 731 conducted some pretty horrible experiments during World War II that certainly are gonna shock anyone who learns about them. This is wild. This definitely belongs on this list. The experiments were meant to be done as a way to prepare for biological warfare, but the process was horrible and extremely inhumane, as are most of these things. Different medical schools and universities all provided doctors and other research staff to help conduct these experiments. Big group effort, nice, way to go guys. They used both prisoners and civilians as test subjects. There were a bunch of different experiments that were conducted during this time, some of which involved injecting them with pathogens like cholera or anthrax or operations with just no anesthesia, just weapon testing, all painful stuff, really the worst of the worst. And finally coming in number one, facial expressions experiment. Yep, a wild one to close her off. The facial expressions experiment. Okay, back in 1924, a psychologist with, you guessed it, the University of Minnesota, classic university stuff, he wanted to conduct an experiment to study facial expressions, right? Sounds pretty harmless so far. Dare I say, sounds a little silly. More specifically, he wanted to see if everyone's expressions of emotions were all the exact same. Does happiness look the same on everybody? Does sadness? What about fear or shock, disgust, anger? What about those? So he recruited some volunteers from campus and then painted the lines of their facial muscles black. And then he exposed each participant to different stimuli in order to photograph their reactions. He wanted to compare all these results side by side. The stimuli at hand was intense. This guy wanted big reactions. He included showing them adult films. He exposed them to ammonia. He made them touch reptiles. And of course, horrible things that I can't talk about here on the tube of you. You know what I mean? Horrible, horrible stuff. All in the name of facial expressions. What an awful experiment, what a dark one. Kicking off the list at number 10, glowfish. I never had a fish tank growing up, but if I did, I probably wouldn't want any hybrid glowy fish bouncing around in there, that's for sure, I don't know. That's what lava lamps are for, no? That's a completely different vibe. You'd be doing this while you're trying to sleep. Trying to dodge out glowfish. Back in 2012, while the world was otherwise, you know, preoccupied with not dying or whatever was supposed to happen in 2012, Yorktown Technologies created a hybrid glowfish. They were first created out of zebra fish, but now there's a whole plethora of glowfish that you can purchase, not just the zebra kind. We got tiger barbs, we got rainbow shark, and betta. I don't know what betta is, but we got them, and they're glowy. We figured out how to make them glowy, I guess to hype up Avatar 2. I think that was supposed to come out back then. I don't see why we needed hybrid glowfish, but here we are. Bioluminescence is natural. We see octopus or deep sea fish that have it naturally, that's cool. But when it's not natural, you can tell. You know what I mean? It looks plasticky. It looks 
not right. Scientists in Singapore were originally aiming to modify fish to spot toxins in polluted water easier. But then on one hand, you're like, ah, oh, they're pretty mesmerizing. They're glowy, we like them, they're cute. Alan Blake, co-founder of said Yorktown Technologies, wanted them to glow only when near toxins. Yeah, this was back in 2003 when they first started. The guy wanted real life toxin notifications in the water. That's crazy. Oh, toxins, there we go. Good idea, but like, there's other ways, I think. Also, don't fish love shiny things? These guys would be lunch in like a matter of minutes. Today we're at a point where glowfish are being sold to houses for, for reasons. Do you want a glowfish? I, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I don't want any part of that. It doesn't affect them in any way. It doesn't hurt, apparently. Their skin just changes. I don't know. That kind of feels like a big deal to me. I'd be, I'd be like, what's going on? Help. Number nine, see-through frog. Yeah, just when you thought frogs were already hard to spot and catch, boom. Now they're invisible, pal. Good luck. Back in 2016, through artificial insemination, scientists successfully took the DNA of two kinds of recessive color mutant frogs. They took black-eyed and gray-eyed frogs, and then they did science. That's what they did. They just smacked them together, and they're like, whoa, that was so easy. They combined them together to create a frog whose skin is always translucent. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason for this. It's cool, but there's also a reason. The see-through factor allows observation of organ growth or cancer formation without having to cut into them, you know what I mean? Kind of helps when you can see the problem, right? No dissection needed for further study. That was the goal here, not bad. But imagine being see-through at all times. I'd be like, hey pal, my eyes are up here, okay? Quit staring at my pancreas. Gotta move on. Number eight. Savannah cats. This one has been talked about for a while now. It's pretty common, weirdly enough. How do we feel about Savannah cats? Let's talk about these little critters. In May 2012, the International Cat Association, I wanna work there, first of all, they registered this Savannah cat as a new official breed. It's official, the international cat community confirmed it. And it all started in the late 80s when Judy Frank crossbred a male several with a domestic Siamese. The offspring was appropriately named Savannah, yeah. Imagine if I was like, no, it's actually Amanda. I lied to you. They just called them Savannah cats for no reason. In turn, now we have cats with big ears. We did it, folks. We did it. Domestic cats mixed with wild African cats. I mean, it sounds like you're going to get another cat. And we did. Great work. I don't know how to tell you this. I mean, apparently they're great. They're not too crazy temper-wise, but they're fun and energetic at the same time. Apparently they're great for families. Yeah, I can't believe I'm saying great for families in a list that gets as dark as it's gonna get. Number seven, the Zorse. The Zorse. Yes, the male zebra, female horse. Now we get a really fun word. Zorse, the Zorse, sorry. It sounds like a god. Yeah, there's Thor, Odin, and then Zorse. Zebroids, that's their scientific name, they're usually quite common, historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses, donkeys, you name it, has been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. So they're very little petite little guys. In 2010, a Zedonk was born. It was a zebra donkey, but again, back in the 70s, this happened before, and no one really talked about it. There were three born in Colchester Zoo. Yeah, those zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip? Bizarre, humans are so weird. They're not too smart, humans. They're like, yeah, let's put these in a cage. It'll be fine. Number six, bees. I hate bees so much. When the window's closed, we're good. Remember when we had to worry about killer bees for a couple months, like a year ago? during an already dark time. Should we still be worried? Are these killer bees coming back? Are they a real thing? Hybrid bees, those are also, huh? Will hybrid bees fight the killer bees? Can we watch this? Can we tune in and watch this on Triller? An experiment in the 70s tried to change the hashtag bee game. And in turn, we got a brand new bee. Yeah, we love those, just new bees to dodge outside. The idea at first was to take a regular honeybee and then breed it with an African honeybee. Ideally, we would get a hybrid bee that can safely <laughs> safely provide more honey than a regular honeybee. Okay, that's steps. We're going towards the future of this one, right? On paper. The experiment obviously didn't work with these new bees and they didn't do that at all. And worst part of all, the bees got out. Yeah, imagine that email to whom it may concern. Oh God, I left the door open, I'm sorry. These bees are aggressive towards other kinds of bees. They're not too nice, they're not too friendly. And they're very aggressive towards humans as well, in case you were wondering. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them afterwards so they can continue stinging multiple times with their stinger butts. Yeah, they don't fall off, right? That's our only hope when we see a bee the size of a tennis ball. We're like, uh, he won't, will he? Will he? I don't think. These bees would, because they can. Yeah, hybrid killer bees. Victims have received 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms. It's a lot, it's a lot of stings, it's a lot of movements from the bee's hips there. That's like some Caesar, that's like the Julius Caesar numbers right there, that's crazy. They react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile to find it. So yeah, don't sneeze. 
Hmm. These bees have caused over 1,000 deaths, so yeah, I, I guess we should worry. We should definitely worry. Hit that thumbs up just because we're like, uh, no, there's, there's no, there's no good in this. That's scary. That's so scary. Hit that thumbs up for bee progression. Let's save the bees. Hit the thumbs up for the bees. Let's save all the bees except for those kind. The other ones are good. Number five, Tygons. Tygons be bygones. Ha <laughs> ha. He's good. I was gonna say Liger, but that's been used before. We know what that one looks like. Tygons were a real hybrid animal you could see for yourself at both the London Zoo and the Manchester Zoo once upon a time. This was of course back in the late 30s where folks didn't, you know, bat an eye towards these kind of things with animals. Yeah, yeah, step on up and see the Tygon. A tiger head, a lion body, and a tiger tail. That's what happens when you put animals in the same cage. Come on out. Well, sometimes they'll get along too well in said cage, and then you'll get a Tygon. Tygon hybrids were seen long before the 90s. Actually, in 1837, Queen Victoria was gifted a Tygon. Imagine that. I wouldn't know what to do with that. I'd be like, hi, what are you? Number four, Hiramitsu Nakachi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This one is insane. Now we're getting to the dark ones here. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here, not just, you know, Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, this is modern science. This is some black mirror type stuff here. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside of mice and rats, and then transplant set embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic, a lot of moving around, and a lot of science, apparently. Cells into rats and mice embryos. How did we even get here? Who thought of this first? We went from the Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for themselves. I like the word pancreas. I've been using it a few times lately. But his hope was that the rodent bodies would use the human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. Here's the thing though, while conducting said experiments, they found that the rats were starting to develop a human type brain. That's when they pulled the plug on that entire project. Yeah, the second humans and animals get too close, governments will come in and go, stop. Number three, beefalo. Beefalo sounds like a Pokemon. It sounds like a thing that's close to being real, but shouldn't be, and that's where it should have stayed, if I'm being honest. The beefalo should have only been a concept. But then a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones did the impossible. Look at him go. One day in 1906, he said, hey, watch this, and then started breeding Arizona bison with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal, you know, just something new to make some money. He ended up giving up on this project entirely and then he just released the animals. Yeah, guy just got bored and released science projects to the wilds. What could go wrong? The beefalo then found their way into a national park where hunting was banned, so they thrived. And they thrived without natural predators at that. The population began to grow by 50% every single year. And at first you're like, wow, we did it. This is like Jurassic Park, but cute. No, their environmental impact was horrible. It was not ideal. They played God. They messed with the circle of life. You eat one bug, then there's a hurricane somewhere else. First off, these guys are very thirsty animals. They can consume 10 gallons of water each trip to a watering hole. They're like that one kid growing up drinking at the water fountain. You're like, guy. Save some, please hurry, I'm so thirsty. Yeah, they drank all the water. Every animal was so thirsty after. They also uh, in said water, so they ruined the entire water park for every other animal involved. Yeah, all bad. Entire ecosystems were messed up at this point. Everybody got thirsty because Charles Buffalo Jones was like, hey, watch this, let's try something new. Number two, don't try this at home. Not sure how many times I have to say this, but don't try any crossbreeding at home or ever for that matter. Because things go south, obviously. For example, back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said that she didn't want to keep her. This is normal, maybe a kid will come into the, the picture, maybe the dog's too aggressive, whatever, and then they have to give it back, okay. When Julie saw the dog, she was in shock. She was like, yeah, I'll take this living animal, first of all, I'm not a monster, thank you, I can do this. People who abandon animals, also, they're the devil, side note. This dog was different, but it wasn't mean. It was just a hybrid. It wasn't healthy, but all the more reason why you should stick around. Know what I mean? The dog had a squished body, it had a huge jaw, and a bad underbite, and it was oddly shaped. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from this backyard breeder who was carelessly breeding a bunch of dogs together, just for fun, not really knowing what he's doing. Thankfully, Julie did know what she was doing. She brought the dog home and gave her a loving home. Sweet little thing. Olivia and I want a dog so badly, so you know what? We'll take this hybrid little lady anytime. Her name's Kuda. She's in great hands, but look at her. She's so cute. And finally, number one, 
lions. Back in the 80s, the Chatbar Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they tried this fun little science experiment for themselves. Yeah, they tried an experimental program rather where they would breed together domestic lions, little petite, you know, well, small in terms of a lion. They would mix them with these massive beastly African lions in the hopes that they would meet in the middle somewhere and be introduced to the wild and help with the dying population of wild lions in India. Again, on paper we wanted to get involved, we want to help restructure the lives of this animal, but the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. And it didn't. Obviously, it's number one. It didn't work. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake. The cubs had weak back legs, they were having extreme trouble walking, and as they got older, their immune systems just started to fail faster and faster. By 2000, they'd bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. That's a lot of, it's a lot of projects, a lot of experiments. So they finally decided to stop the program, thankfully, and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction, which is so odd to me. Like, I'm not a fan of humans at all at this point. They're like, hey, welcome to Earth. Yeah, it kind of sucks, right? It's hot. Okay, cool. Cool, we're gonna stop making you now. Cheers. What? Naturally, thankfully, there are laws that prohibit officials from just killing these animals, so now they're just simply waiting for them to die naturally, which is, it's better. It's certainly better, but still, stop messing with nature, guys. What do I have to, how many times do I have to tell you? Stop messing with nature. Kicking off the list at number 10, Stubbins Firth. Okay, this is one of the craziest science projects I have ever heard of in my entire life. Ugh, oh, so gross. Stubbins Firth, a researcher from Pennsylvania in the late 1700s. First of all, as you can probably guess, the 1700s. Methods back then, they got a little messy from time to time, sure. A lot of firsts in the medical science world back then. Firth was a doctor in training at the time, and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if you had Twitter. Firth would surgically insert vomit from patients with yellow fever into his own body. He would like put it in wounds all over his face, his eyes. He was trying to get it. He was going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. Thanks, Firth. So gross. Even urine and saliva, anything DNA-wise, anything gross, just pour it in. That's it, all over. Firth to our surprise, did not get sick. Hmm. Yeah, he was proud of that one too. He told everybody this new revelation. We look back now though and realize Firth just sampled late stage patients this entire time. So they were further along, much further than the contagious period. Yeah, no one really knew. So basically he volunteered to dump uh, all over his, uh. yeah, history is so gross. Science as well, gets nasty. Number nine, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather. They would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work. Yeah, he was known as the fastest knife in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already in this one? A crowd, a fast surgery, what? What's going on? This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quickly, pun intended. He would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes or less. Nice. One in 10 would pass away, but this was a time where those were good odds, until it wasn't. Robert attempted to beat any record previously held that during a surgery, he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers by accident, as well as the, you know, patient's leg. But wait, it gets worse. Yeah, when he was swinging away, he also accidentally hit somebody else watching. Remember how I said crowds would gather at the old surgery crowd? Yeah, this is why you don't stand close. It's kind of like crump battles, you know? You can't get too close. Disaster is waiting in there. You don't wanna get smoked with a timberland. I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now. I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time. That's also nice too. Number seven. Jose Delgado. Okay, we're talking mind control now, so I'll give you a, I'll give you a moment to put on your tinfoil hat. In the early 1900s, Jose Delgado graduated from the University of Madrid. He even lands a professorship at Yale University. Guy's killing it. But his mind was focused on others' minds. He was committed to mind control. His go-to method was these implants, like electrode implants with wires. He first used it with primates, as you could have guessed, horrible classic. He would use a remote control to make them do certain moves, even moving on to mind controlling a bull. Yeah, he got in the ring with said mind-controlled bull, but then oddly enough, the bull was calm. Weird. Almost like there's an implant in his brain and he's confused and doesn't want anything to do with that. Huh, how did he do it? Genius. Reports say that he stopped the bull last second before it charged at him. I say there's a thing in his head and he wasn't sure what was up. That's my vote. Poor thing. And then next, as you could have guessed, came the people. 25 people were tested with this mind control device by electronically controlling the brain. He believes armies could be controlled down the road. And until his death in 2011, he was upset. Yeah, he was upset he wasn't cited as often in terms of mind control projects in recent studies. Like, guy who mind control animals in the 1900s. Yeah, we're trying not to do that anymore. Maybe. Thanks. Number six, 
Ilya Ivanov. In the late 1800s, another old weird experiment with animals was underway. Here we go. Soviet biologists, they actually got permission from the country to breed hybrid ape humans. Yep, what did you get up to last summer? Oh, oh let me tell you, my friends. Horrible, who does this? This is crazy, who thinks of this? They grafted an ovary into a chimp and the goal was to fertilize Nora, the chimp, with human DNA. Nightmare. So they inseminated a group of chimps. None of them got pregnant, obviously, so instead they tried to flip the project around. This time they had a human inseminated with the DNA of chimps. The volunteer number was obviously low. Luckily, nothing actually happened. This would have been an absolute train wreck. Before the project went underway, he was sent to Kazakhstan and he thankfully didn't go up to any more science projects at that point. No mixing DNAs, nothing's going around. We're good. We like dodged that bullet, but huh, we got close. Number five, William Buckland. Late 1700s, contemporary of Charles Darwin himself. Yeah, William Buckland, historically, he made some Jurassic waves. He was the first man to write a description of a fossilized dinosaur. He's into weird stuff, I guess. He's unfortunately also known for weird stuff more than, uh, you know, the dino discovery stuff. William Buckland would eat some strange dishes, all in the name of, you know, science and discovering new things with DNA. They were bored, I guess. He roasted hedgehogs, ostriches, panthers, bats, he ate everything. Like, I get it, it was the late 1700s, but eating these animals as often as he did, plus his brains, now we gotta ask some questions. What's going on? What's the end game here, my guy? One of the most bizarre things that he studied up close and personal was the heart of King Louis the 14th. Yeah, the way these scientists would handle tasks like old school testing, not ideal, actually quite gross. Number four, Francis Crick. Here we go, before we get really, really dark here with the science and health studies and stuff, we need to mention aliens. You heard me, tinfoil's on already, we're good. In the early 1900s, Francis Crick, the guy who discovered DNA alongside James Watson, two brilliant minds, dare I say life-changing discoveries, they also believed in directed transpermia, meaning that humans were put on this planet by aliens. Yeah, like extraterrestrials, like actual like aliens, like another species planted us here on purpose, like a science project. Yeah, scientists believe that they are a science project. Some of his methods, conversations to patients were obviously quite sketchy with these beliefs in order. Hey, let's talk about DNA. I'm brilliant. Also, did you know aliens left you here? Great, have a great day. Here's your bill. It's a lot of money. It's really old. Number three, John Bodkin Adams. He was once a general practitioner in the British community in Essex, and most of his patients were unfortunately elderly, and he treated said elderly patients with care. Now, there's obviously more. It gets dark. From 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that all suspiciously died, and out of those 160, 132 of them just happened to leave valuables over for him. Yeah, he ended up dying a very rich man. What are the odds? Must have been some great care he was providing, eh? Not fishy at all. Of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent because, well, as per this list, it was the worst of the worst. And the worst part of all this? John was acquitted after everything. Yeah, his trial established that the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain, may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten their life. So they're like, oh, it sometimes happens, so we can't punish him. Yeah, no, look at the numbers here. So out of the dozens of cases that ended horribly, Adams was only charged for two. And he wasn't even convicted of their deaths even. He was just guilty of forging prescriptions and falsifying medical forms. He even reopened his practice. Yeah, although he was fined. He was fined only 2,000 pounds. The general public knew he had taken the lives of at least eight people, so he didn't do much after that. But like I said, he ended up passing away rich at the age of 84. Number two, Morris Bulber. He was once part of the Philadelphia Poison Ring, which, yep, already you're like, oh, number two, we're already here. Here we go. Yeah, that was a real thing. How horrible does that sound. The Philadelphia Poison Ring. Okay, it was led by these two Italian cousins. It was led by Paul and Herman Petrillo. This was back in the 1930s. And these two brothers, these two bros, they were perfect for each other in a horrible, dark, disgusting way. Harold was the arson who knew how to make counterfeit money, and Paul ran an insurance scam out of the back of his tailor business. So already this awful duo exists, and then in comes Morris Bulber, this Jewish Russian immigrant who believed in something called La Fatura, this magical practice that Italians from South Philadelphia believed in at the time. So bad, and then in comes crazy science, medical magic, just to make it better. Yeah, just add some spirit fingers into this horribleness. So Dr. Bulber would come in and give potions to patients, specifically patients from these cousins that they issued insurance policies from without medical exams. So they got this Dr. Bulber to then poison them with arsenic. The reason they had this scheme was because their insurance policies paid out the gang rather than the now widowed wives. How sad is that? This kicked off around 1931 and roughly 50 people bit the bullet before he was thankfully arrested in 1939. And yes, he turned the evidence over so those two cousins were also equally found guilty. Yeah, everyone's sentenced to death here. And finally, number one, Dr. Satan. 
Here's a fun little nickname, Dr. Satan. Yeah, let's talk about this guy. Marcel Petio. It all started when he was young, as most of these do. He would get expelled from school, he had trouble with other students, and his first crime, his first adult crime, was mail fraud. Reminder, this was the early 1900s. Marcel was actually found to be mentally unfit to stand on trial after he was arrested, so later he joined the army. Yeah, that's the real sentence. That's the order that things happen in. The army later discharged him after he was caught stealing blankets. And come 1921, he decided to get a degree. Yeah, he began practicing in France, and at the same time, in 1926, he became the mayor. Yeah, we have a medical doctor and mayor all at the same time in the early 1900s. This sounds like a Tim Burton movie already. I'm already nervous. The guy loses his spot as a mayor because he stole power from the city. Yeah, he stole power from the city, like a real villain, right? And in 1933, his crimes became historically horrible. YouTube doesn't like us talking about Hitler and the Yahtzees, but we'll rhyme them, you know, we'll outrhyme the algorithm. This is history, we gotta talk about it. Marcel would talk to Jewish residents while World War II was on folding and he would lie. He would say that he's gonna assist them by injecting them with what he said was medicine, but after they'd passed away, he would steal all their belongings and dispose of their bodies in the basement. It's horrible. It's perhaps one of the worst things I've ever heard of. Come 1943, he was thankfully arrested, and after the liberation of Paris, he was found guilty for killing over 60 people. And in 1946, he finally met his fate via the guillotine. In our number 10 spot, we have mice with human butts. Okay, so not exactly human butts per se, but with human anal sphincters. Which, if you don't know what that is, don't worry, I didn't either, I had to look it up. An anal sphincter is a group of muscles at the end of the rectum that surrounds the anus and controls the release of stool, aka Poop. So anyways, in 2011, scientists were able to create a human-mouse hybrid by bioengineering human anal sphincters out of human nerves and muscles and surgically transplanting them onto their rear ends. Yep, sounds horrifying, but this was in fact an experiment that was done with the hope that, if proven successful, the scientists can help humans by making replacement anal sphincters for them. They were quite happy with their results as the mice seemed to take well to them as they fused with the rest of the flesh. They even found that the mice could relax and contract them like their own natural sphincters. Wild. In our number 8 spot we have mice with human brains. This is one of those experiments that makes you wonder what the world will look like in 20 years. This is an experiment that was done in 2014 where mice were given millions of human brain cells. Each mouse in the experiment had about 12 million human cells to be in fact, and in the experiment the researchers noticed that the human cells tended to take over the mouse brain cells. Move over, we're more powerful than you. The experiment was quite the success, with the scientists discovering that these mice showed that their memory was four times stronger than a regular mouse's. Unfortunately though, they had to go through some pretty inhumane practices to learn this fact, including playing really loud music and attacking the mice with an electrical shocking tool. They were then able to measure how the mice reacted the next Next time they heard the sound. Gosh, memory is such a crazy thing. To think that sound, smell, taste, sight, touch can all cause pain if there's a specific memory attached to them is honestly wild. In today's seventh spot, we have monkeys with human cells. Okay, so you're probably thinking, isn't this possibly a dangerous experiment as humans and monkeys are already super close to each other in many ways? Well, in 2007, Yale University decided to take the risk and find out. They put human neural stem cells into five different monkeys to analyze how it would affect Parkinson's disease. The experiment proved to be quite successful as the monkeys who suffered with the disease all could eat and walk and move way better than they could before. They also observed that the monkeys had no tumors or tremors and no bad side effects. The experiment was quite ethically controversial even though it was a success and so whether it continues to be done with monkeys in the future is unclear. In our number six spot we have the human chimpanzee. Another risky experiment, but one that was done when there wasn't a very high concern for human ethics, so aka a while ago. Apparently in 1967, a group of Chinese scientists were successful in impregnating a chimpanzee with human sperm. Two Chinese scientists have claimed this, but it hasn't been officially confirmed to be true. But from what they have said, 
they were successful with their experiment, and the chimpanzee was three months pregnant, only to be killed in a horrific attack on the lab, and all of their work was destroyed. It is said that this was due to the cultural revolution at the time. In any case, scientists have claimed to want to try this experiment again in the 80s, but nothing came of it. Probably for the best, as it has also been said that they plan to use this human chimpanzee hybrid to drive carts and herd sheep and also send it out to space. This is purely on the basis of it having a human brain, of course. But yeah, maybe ethically not a good reason for creating these creatures. In our number four spot today, we have the human pig. An experiment was done in the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to try and examine how human cells would interact with pig cells if they were to come in contact with each other. Through concocting this experiment, the clinic was able to successfully produce a pig with human cells. Yes, it was still a pig seemingly on the outside, but on the inside, half of its cells were human. They injected human cells into pig fetuses and voila, a human pig hybrid. Through doing this experiment, they noticed that the pig cells stayed to one side of the body while the human cells stayed to the other side. But every so often, some of the cells would interact and fuse together to make a brand new DNA, a human pig DNA. Pretty cool. It would be awesome if they would allow these animals to grow so that they can study them to see if they end up being able to do any humanly functions over time, but as such, that is not the case so far. In our number three spot today, we have human animal milk. Scientists from Russia and Belarus successfully genetically modified goats to produce human breast milk. Since then, scientists from all over have been trying to make the milk more human. As much as the Russian and Belarusian scientists tried, they only managed to make the milk 60% human with a specific enzyme, lysamine, and the protein, lactoferrin, being apparent. They are usually found in human milk. Apparently, a Chinese team made a whole herd of cattle, that's 300 cattle, that produced human milk. The goal is to make human breast milk more available in stores for mothers that can't can't breastfeed and have to resort to formula. There's talk of the same company wanting to create a human milk cheese, and that is where I draw the line. What is the purpose of this? Just no. Finally, coming up in our number one spot today, we have the rabbit man. Yes, you heard that correctly. A man that is a rabbit. I was gonna say, you know, something out of a nightmare, but honestly, nah, a pig man would be way more terrifying. In Shanghai in 2003, a team of scientists successfully infused human cells in rabbit eggs in a laboratory dish, creating an embryo of a new creature that was, yes, you guessed it, half rabbit, half human. Apparently, the United States scientists have been trying to perform this experiment for quite some time, but never managed to fully pull it off as none ever survived. In this experiment, the majority of the DNA in the creatures was human, and and just a small amount of them was rabbit. Apparently, they never allowed the world to see this creature as after a few days of growth, they decided to destroy it and harvest it for stem cells. Damn, why would they go through all of that trouble only to destroy it? We could have possibly had our first talking animal. Oh, humans. Number 10, monkey head transplant. Okay, right off the top, here we go, pun intended. The first ever successful monkey head transplant was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard about this. It's probably pretty hard to forget. Maybe ask them about it tonight while they're mid bite at dinner. American researcher Robert White pulled off the otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a headless monkey. Yeah, add a little time and energy and Voila, this actually worked. Yeah, believe it or not, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to, which, I mean, totally fair. I'd be a little pissed off too if I just had a different body all of a sudden. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, which is much further than I ever thought. But the fact that this actually happened is one, terrifying, and two, dare I say, miraculous. This is some sci-fi stuff right here. And here you go, new head, enjoy. Number seven, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptian times and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody is pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. Now, it was developed in 1931 by Dr. Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen is doctors would inject they would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant. And the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate test, 
yeah, historical, of course, it changed the game. Would it also end up with the rabbits passing away? Sadly, also a third yes. It's sad, but more often than not, when humans are involved with any medical process, the test subject dies. You know, before having its head transferred to another animal or something, you're like, what the f is happening here? Number six, small brain and big brain. This next one here, I mean, again, we're on a part three. We're getting into some f up stuff, here we go. In the early 19th century, humans were figuring out a lot of uh, firsts, you know, especially German researcher, Carl August Weinhold. He was on the quest to prove to all that the brain and its nervous system were both attached by wires. Yeah, in order to do so, he took brains and spinal cords of deceased cats and he filled the cavities inside with zinc and silver batteries. And like we know now, the obvious happened. The bodies began to reanimate as if they were alive again. Huh, it's like it's black magic. Or batteries, probably batteries. It's definitely the batteries. This was the first time this type of test was done and now we use electricity and silver for other ways, of course. But thanks to this curious doctor, the early 19th century saw some early Bill Nye the Gross Science Guy stuff. Again, Imagine walking into this room by accident, like, ho oh, ho, what's going on in here now? Number five, the multi-dog. Ah, nice, I love dogs. Let's get a bunch for the price of none. Back in the 50s, when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a multi-dog, Time Magazine had to cover it. Of course, this is a feat in science. As cruel as it sounds, of course, the adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. It's impressive, but also you're like, ew, my God, Jesus. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog, the body, for lack of a better term, gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics, which was the craziest point here. Some say it was playful with its growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. It's a sad 1950 Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive for a long time. It just, you know, all of a sudden it was on something's neck and then it was in the next life. That's horrible. Number four, the Great Razor Auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the Great Auk would grow to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were little cute tiny boys. They were cute, but quite defenseless, obviously, since they're not here anymore. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting. And it just happened to be where most of these great ox were all living. Yeah, Newfoundland, go get screeched in and then take out a thousand ox. There we go. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island. What a but now, scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs, you know, people, how they have, you know, birds in jars and stuff like that. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor build auk. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore may bring these birds back to life. So cute flappy wings may just return. Remember that game, Flappy Wings? Disappeared from the app store so quick. Disappeared faster than number three, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled islands all over the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue. They didn't have any natural predator until, you know, we came along. Sorry, we got hungry. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. That's where it comes from. They weren't just loved by sailors either. No, monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. And reminder, they were big eggs. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681. Again, imagine being that guy, what a dick. But could it be? Could we bring the dodo back to life with science? Yes, apparently, this could be a real thing. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes and we're gonna see them in the sky. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back, you know, animals and stuff. Scientifically, that's a wonderful feat, but do we really think no one's gonna make dodo bird chicken wings? I'm gonna get that on Uber Eats in a year. I can just smell it. Number two, the gastric brooding frog. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Nice, we're getting close to the end, it seems. I'm a big fan of frogs and the gastric brooding frog is particularly interesting to me and also scientists due to their birthing process. If you're eating something, now would be a good time to you know, hit that thumbs up, maybe take a break, put that food to the side for a bit. See, these frogs back, you know, and when they were alive, they would swallow their eggs and then they would hatch them later out of their mouths. Pretty, pretty horrible if you watch that in time lapse, I bet. They're fascinating creatures. And with the Lazarus Project, scientists are actually trying to bring back the Australian gastric brooding frog from extinction. So we might see this horrible act in person. You might go to catch a frog and then all of a sudden it'll be like, Wah! and there's a baby will come out of it and you'll be like, all right, I'm all set actually, how about that? They went extinct back in 1983, but 
scientists have figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys back out of extinction, it would be one point for Gryffindor. We'd be looking a lot better. That's all I'm saying. And finally, number one, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to end with my girl, Martha. The passenger pigeon once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was the 19th century, and it looked a lot different. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block the sun out for a short amount of time. Wow. Hashtag flocks that block. We love it. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeon, just, just, they're, they're gone, just like that. They're no more. So what exactly happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She sadly passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her past and their extinction. And we found a couple. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated the nicest looking pigeon, arguably. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now they blended passenger pigeon DNA with dinosaur DNA, so that's always exciting. We've seen a few movies on how that can go wrong. We're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, I'm glad science is allowing us to, you know, try again, have another go, but look at the pigeons we have now. Those pigeons are hardcore. These things will walk onto the subway with you. Pigeons today will ask you for change. They're ruthless, they're covered in mustard. It's not the same. These graceful birds from the 19th Tens, I feel like we're bringing back Captain America. You know what I mean? I don't think these old school chaps will appreciate the new game of pigeons. They're a little dirty. I don't know. I don't think they're ready, and I don't think we are either. Mm -hmm.